Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're interested in digital advertising, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is the vice president and head of ad operations at Hulu, the U.S.-based subscription video on demand service. But before I introduce you to Adam Moser, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek into the episodes and the professions we're going to be featuring that week. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Adam Moser, Vice President and Head of Ad Operations at Hulu, where he's responsible for overseeing the company's day-to-day advertising platform operations and strategic ad tech investments. Since joining Hulu, Adam has been instrumental in maintaining a best-in-class advertising experience across the video platform. Prior to joining Hulu, Adam was the vice president of digital sales operations at NBC Universal, where he oversaw the teams responsible for delivering ads across the company's broadcast and cable portfolios. And before that, Adam supported sales operations at CBS Interactive, where he managed video ad implementation across CBS Sports and Entertainment. He was also a part of the team that helped to establish and implement ad serving at MTV Networks, Viacom's first entry into online full episode streaming. Adam, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Thank you so much. I am. I am. Uh, I am full of caffeine here. I'm on a uh, a cup that holds about twenty ounces. So, uh, oh my God! Well, I have moved on. I have to confess, I've had my coffee already, but I'm on the East Coast where it's already mid afternoon. You're on the West Coast, and I'm on my green smoothie. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, if we're uh, if we're being fully transparent, it's no longer twenty ounces. It's about three ounces left. So maybe that'll. <laughs> Oh my gosh. The energy in my voice. (laughs) Well, for our listeners, Adam, including me, who may not be familiar with the online full episode streaming world, does it operate or function in a similar way to a media company like NBC or CBS where you used to work? Yeah. You know, when you boil down to an advertising organization, whether it's the one at Hulu or in my previous roles at at NBC or CBS, our primary function is how do we solve a customer's challenge? How do we meet the goal that they're trying to achieve while also achieving our own goals? And that's sort of the basis of any advertising organization, whether it's a linear one, whether it's some legacy print models, whether it's a digital world and streaming advertising that exists today. Again, you know, at the end of the day, we want to see what's the best way that we can achieve a customer's objectives. And customers being the companies that want to advertise on Hulu. Sure. It brands themselves, a specific client or the ad agency that might be working on behalf of a number of partners and brands on their end. Each has their own objectives and key performance indicators, KPIs that they are looking to achieve. And Hulu or any advertising organization would want to create an opportunity that shows the best case why that particular media company is a strong place for those investments to achieve those particular objectives. Mm. So your title is vice president and head of ad operations at Hulu. What are ad operations? Sure. So think of it this way. A deal is, and this is a very overly simplistic, high-level description of an advertising transaction, but its deal is closed. A customer or an agency is coming to a publisher wanting to make an investment or seeking to advertise on a platform like Hulu. That deal is transacted and it comes down through the sales channel of the account executives. So they're the ones who work on the direct person-to-person 
transaction. And then it comes over towards your operations organization. So there are some elements of the team that do forecasting. So they're the ones who are making sure that there's enough inventory. And in our case, that's digital ad impression. And they want to make sure that there's enough that can fulfill that particular objective. It can move over to a planning group. So they're the ones who will own the transaction of that particular invoice and break it into very tangible line items. So those will break down into the ad products that we've sold that meet back towards the buy of the customer. And then it'll move over towards your digital advertising operations org. And they're the ones who will really take on the stewardship, working with the customers to receive the advertising creatives. Uh, in our case, those are video assets and do the implementation. And, and the implementation is really w- what we call the process of trafficking and getting those videos, those digital videos into the system so that they can air and essentially run across the service. Okay. So I don't want to put you on the spot here, but what are all the different departments that relate to advertising at Hulu? So there's a number of parts. If you're thinking specifically of Hulu, we have a subscription model as well as an ad supported model. And so all parts of the company come together on those goals. It's not just the ad sales organization that is focused on the advertising. It's our content teams. It's our marketing teams. It's our subscription teams. It's our tech and platform teams, making sure that we have a service that is engaging and accessible. And then by and large, we want to make sure that we are thinking of viewer first advertising. And by that, I mean, what is an advertising experience that one can support our customers and customers in this case, meaning our advertising customers? And what is an experience that is viewer first so that it is helping to keep the viewer engaged, helping them to offer very purposeful advertising. How do we give them something that's very relevant to that particular viewer, making sure that the ad that they're seeing is at the right time for the right person at the right moment. And so all parts of the company really come together to make sure that we have a really strong viewer experience. So maybe I'm getting too much into the weeds, but a question popped into my head, which is, are you able to tailor the ad to the viewer? So that you know that, for example, in my house, there's a 16-year-old and then two 50-year-olds so that we would see a certain type of ads versus the family that had children who were under the age of seven. So from a specific standpoint, no. So we would never know that Andrea, per se, is watching and this is the ad specific to But there are advertising models where we're looking at audience segments where you're leveraging opportunities to serve something very relevant to a particular viewer. So someone who, based on a number of different data sets, falls into a category who might be a parent. Obviously, an ad for diapers is much more relevant to them than someone who falls into a bunch of data categories that showcase them as someone who's single. Okay. So that's how you can kind of slice and dice some of your subscriber data. Yeah. And to be more specific, there's a few different data policies that have taken effect both in Europe as well as here in the United States. And so Hulu always abides by really strict data regulation, making sure that we are doing everything that we can that is by the law of the land and ensuring that we're not encroaching upon any data infraction of our viewers. Good to know. Now, when you were talking about some of those ads and making sure that they're relevant to the viewers so that the brands are reaching the audience that they want to reach and that's most relevant to them, are the advertisements themselves being created outside of Hulu and then you receive them? Or do you also create advertisements in-house? For the most part, these are advertisements that are created for television. And Hulu is streaming TV. That's where we see the future of television. So these are ads that a particular media company could be running, but could also be running across linear television channels as well. And that said, we do have our own internal teams that can work on very bespoke custom creations for a particular sponsorship opportunity. But that's more specific to a particular advertiser's business challenge and more bespoke to something we may be working on with them. The bulk of our advertising are video assets and commercials that you would see on television. And when we look at Hulu as television. Mm -hmm. So what do you do as the head of this department, Adam, as the head of the ad operations at Hulu? I never have a day that looks exactly like the day before it. (laughs) And I oversee an organization that's about 120 folks. And we're broken up into multiple functions. One is like the roles and responsibilities I was mentioning before, where we're doing the stewardship and execution of those 
advertisements, making sure we're working with the clients to ensure that the performance and delivery of those advertising campaigns have to the best of their ability. But we also have internal teams within my org that act as a backstop for that group. So they do the first step triaging or troubleshooting that gets passed up from sort of the more entry level roles that might be working on a campaign. And then we also have a group that has a more seasoned responsibility. They work on our automated businesses. So in the advertising space, we refer that as the programmatic offering. For Hulu, that's our advanced TV offering. And so there are people who have a number of years under their belt and have been trained specifically within that particular programmatic marketplace and help us work with customers so that we can transact more in real time. Mm, Okay. And so how many direct reports do you have? So I have four direct reports that report directly to me. Each of them has a team of managers, which each have a team of individual contributors reporting up to them. And so when I think of where my time and my functions, most often I'm a support function, if you think about it in terms of who I support. So obviously supporting my direct reports as they're working with their teams and making sure that they have the tools and direction that they need to be able to succeed. Certainly in support of our account executives and our frontline sellers, our sales managers and sales executives, making sure that things that we want to do in the marketplace are able to be achieved. And then, of course, by and large, an operations org is in support of the customers themselves, making sure that their advertising campaigns can run as effectively as possible on our platform. Okay. I looked up digital ad operations before this interview started, and I'm curious how much of this resonates with what your team does. It says that it refers to the systems and processes that support the management and delivery of advertisements through digital mediums, including display, and by that they say banner and rich media ads, video text, search, and by that they mean Google search ads, mobile advertising, and more. Yeah, that is a pretty, I would say broad in the sense of it's encompassing all different types of digital advertising. But that is a great way of describing it, thinking about the transaction of all of those digital assets through systems. So the primary focus, in addition to the support that we were just talking about, is what are the systems and tools we need to most efficiently be able to operate? At any particular media company, your revenue is hopefully growing. And as you continue to grow and scale, the processes and the tools and the systems that you utilize need to evolve as well. And so the big area of focus for where I meet with other executives around the company at Hulu is what are the investments that we need either commercially or developing internally that can help us optimize our processes so that we are able to serve as effectively as possible, but in a way that is allowing us to really scale as our revenue goals continue to scale. So In that regard, are you talking about like software that you might want to invest in or other types of hardware that you might need in order to become more efficient in what you do? Yeah, I mean, forgive me for going very deep into the woods for the moment. But the way an ad is served, a digital ad is served to a viewer is through something called an ad server and an ad system engine. And what that's essentially doing is it's processing a ton of different data points all in real time to decide what's the right advertising to serve in this particular moment. In the case of video, we're looking at a lot of different things. It's not just any particular information about the type of viewer that might be consuming that content, but really about what are the KPIs of that particular advertising campaign at the moment? So how long is that campaign supposed to be running? Is it running for a week, for a month? How many impressions is it supposed to deliver? Is it supposed to deliver 100,000 impressions or a million impressions? And then our ad system is deciding in real time, is this the particular ad? Is advertising video A right now the one I need to serve to ensure that it's staying on pace to deliver towards that end goal? And because of that, because so much changes in our industry in terms of the type of advertising, in terms of the innovations that we can make, where there's a lot of things that you can serve to a viewer that allow them to engage and interact with the advertising. All of that requires a constant innovation and thought on how to best optimize an ad platform. We have a fantastic ad platform and engineering team at Hulu, and they're great partners that we work with around those concepts, what we're seeing in the marketplace, what we're seeing from our customers, as well as ideas and what they're seeing in terms of technical innovation to come together to really create the best viewer first advertising experience that we can have. What are the innovations that you see on the horizon? Well, one of the things that is probably most interesting, specifically to Hulu, we have a a binge product that we released. And what that is, is that will recognize when a viewer is in a binge experience. So a binge is qualified as watching three or more episodes in one particular sitting. And we optimize the ad. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And we can optimize the ad experience for that, meaning we can recognize that someone is watching in that particular pattern and serve an ad that we have loaded into the system that encourages them, hey, we recognize that you're watching, keep watching. It's very tongue in cheek and, and fun messaging. And if you can make it to the third episode, there might be a reward, like maybe that episode is ad free and you can just stream it all the way through or a particular partner might have a promo code or something that we can help them partner with. So those are innovative experiences that, again, as streaming television takes on the life that it's taking on, Companies like Hulu can really lean into making a more relevant and effective advertising experience. And gone are the days where I think viewers expect to just show up at eight o'clock on a Thursday and watch 30 minutes straight of programming with a five minute ad break in the middle, save for sports and news, which of course are always live and of the moment. But those are really, really great opportunities for a streaming company to be able to lean in and again, create that viewer first advertising. That's something that doesn't feel too disruptive, but also feels like we're speaking to each other. Interesting. So I'm curious if we've already talked about this because your LinkedIn profile notes that one of your responsibilities is overseeing strategic ad tech investments. Is that what we were just talking about or is there something else involved? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly that. As we think through what are the systems and tools that my team needs to become more efficient, the group is the size they are today. We want to keep growing in terms of our revenue goals, but we want to do it in a way where we can, as the leader of our organization, Peter Naylor always says, let the machines do what the machines do and not necessarily need people to do the specific button pushing. And what that really gets at is we hire really smart people. We have really great experience with the folks that are on our teams. We really want to leverage them to be more revenue revenue strategists in terms of how they can help our customers and our sellers achieve the goals that we're after. And by eliminating the time we spent doing some of the manual keystroking, it opens up the time for us to be much more strategic in how we support, and I go back to that word of support, but how we support the partners that we work with. One of the things that we touched on at the very end of the Espresso Shots interview and our listeners, if they want to learn more about how to break into digital advertising, they should check out show notes for this episode to see if it's already dropped. But we were talking about how your team members, because they're seeing so much advertising day in and day out, without even realizing it, are themselves becoming expert on what kinds of ads work, what kinds of ads are successful. What would you say to that, Adam, in terms of the kinds of ads that you are seeing really not only reach their KPIs, but maybe knock them out of the park because the ads are so effective? Well, I, it always stands out to me are advertisers that know they are advertising. And I, that sounds maybe a little glib, but what I mean by that is there are some spots, and I won't name specific advertisers or categories, but there are some spots where you can just tell, you can tell by the people who are in the room with you that are watching that they might still be watching the screen, but maybe their engagement starts to tune out based on the messaging. And then you can see some, and you know, you get a lot of this around some of your top tier events on the calendar, like in Oscars or the Super Bowl, where you get creative that is very creative and innovative for the moment. And of course, the engagement is always much higher in that realm when someone feels like, oh, I get it. Yes, you are advertising to me, but whether it's breaking the fourth wall or whether it's having a really creative way of landing your message, I'm there. I'm there for the ride, whether it's for 15 seconds, 30 seconds or longer. And again, in an ad operation at all levels, we see a ton of ad creative. And so it's always interesting when you can talk shop in that way through a different lens, because again, those are skills that they only come through just the experience on the job and the amount of time that we've spent being able to look at these ads. Are there certain kinds of people, perhaps more visually oriented or people who love spreadsheets and numbers? You also mentioned the data crunching side in the Espresso Shots interview, but maybe those who also enjoy artistic projects who are better suited for this type of work. Advertising is such a broad field that can tap into so many different experiences. My background, I was a film major. I went to school in New York for uh, for film and animation. I started out at an animation studio. I learned production. I learned how the cogs of something need to all come together to achieve a particular outcome. And that was very translatable as I entered into an advertising organization from the operations side because I was able to see how all these pieces came together. And so when I think about your question about do people benefit with maybe a creative eye, I think there are parts of it that can speak to a lot of different skill sets. Some people are not 
visual learners are very creative and yet they can have a really solid and excellent careers in an ad organization because they are so analytical and they do understand how to achieve certain goals just based on the data that they see. Some people are completely visual and and not math people and (laughs) they get dizzy at the sign of an Excel spreadsheet. And yet they may have a totally different focus in terms of the creative side of advertising. How do you get your message across? How do you, at the end of the day, we're all storytellers. How do you tell that story to the viewer? So it is a really broad field that has a lot of different opportunities for different skill sets. For our young listeners, Adam, who may still be in school right now, or maybe they graduated recently, is there a particular software know-how or are there other tools and skills that they should absolutely be trying to acquire either if they're still in school or even in an online course at a site like General Assembly or Coursera to make themselves more competitive in the job market so that they could break into a media company like Hulu? Yeah, an experience that someone can come out of school with is is a funny thing because we're at a point where I don't know that you necessarily need to look specifically at a particular keyword on a resume and say, that's the person that, and I can only look for that type of person. And we found a lot of success. And I'm very fortunate to have a phenomenal team that comes from so many different areas of expertise that the days of only looking at someone who has a media or marketing background, and they're the only ones applicable, I don't think that's necessarily relevant anymore. I think being able to speak to the life experiences We are all storytellers. And I had mentioned this on the espresso shots. At the end of the day, everybody is always selling. Everybody is always a salesperson with regards to some aspect of their personal or professional life. And so I think the ability of someone to be able to come in and understand the advertising world. And again, we're talking about the entry level of an organization, and especially if they're going on the digital side, but they have a really strong thirst for the technical knowledge. Like they have an interest in just How does an ad get onto a service like Hulu? And that they've been able to pick it up because they're viewers themselves. They pick on certain trends and certain things that we might be doing. Again, that stands out to me more so than a particular class that someone's taken. I think it's really important to have a broad workforce that can really look at advertising from a number of different points of view, as opposed to one that has all kind of been funneled through a specific education or landscape. Yeah, that makes sense. So as you know, Adam, I give my guests the opportunity to suggest questions for me to ask them or to share some thoughts with me ahead of our interview. And you wrote that there are a few aha moments that while seemingly insignificant at the time, now play an important part in how you approach your professional life. And these moments have made their way into advice that you give members of your team when they're asking for guidance. What were those aha moments for you? I think back to one very specifically throughout my career. So I work with a number of fantastic people, and I've been fortunate to work for a number of fantastic people. There was one woman, Amy Paris, back in my days at NBC, who you know, my role was expanding and there was a particular opportunity that didn't necessarily work out the way that I had envisioned. And she said something to me that was at the time very simple. And I find myself going back to it as well as talking through members of my team about it now. But her advice very simply said is do your job well and good things will happen. And in my particular organization, some of our team members are in that first or second stage of their career and they're really hungry for success. They're really engaged. They were they really wanted to come work for a company like Hulu. And then once they get in the door, they really want to grow and support and succeed at Hulu, which again, as a manager is the best type of attitude you can hope for from one of your team members. But the timeline in which those expectations for their growth may not always align with the realities of the business need. And so I always think back to that piece of advice from Amy, which I mentioned to my team members when anytime I'm doing a coffee chat or talking to the group that's the entry level of my group is to say, be patient. You're learning. Things are very specific to how Hulu operates. And some things are very specific to how a digital ad operations group operates. But the opportunity that might be right ahead of you, that might seem like the obvious next step that you have to go for right now may not always work out, but that's okay. You know, if you have your manager that's telling you why it didn't work out and they're giving you that feedback of what you need to work on, they're essentially helping you cheat at the next test. And they're giving you a way to take those pieces of feedback out of the equation for the next time. And so where that all comes together is to say, if the opportunity doesn't work out, again, just focus in on what your existing responsibilities are, kill it at them, and then you'll make yourself stand out and become that much more invaluable for the next opportunity. Yeah, I can totally remember back to when I was in my early 20s, mid 20s, and I was only ever looking up and not really appreciating 
where I was. And it makes me think of that book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote about how it really takes about 10,000 hours of diligent work to become expert. And 10,000 hours, if you're working a 40-hour week, translates to about five years worth of work. And you are not wasting your time doing some of those entry-level responsibilities because you are honing your craft and you are developing really important skills. Would you agree with that? Yeah. In my particular field, the landscape changes so dramatically so quickly that you can master your current skill set or the current focus that you have. Let's call a time frame six months. But what you're doing over the next six months might be radically different, even in the same role as what you were doing for the first six months. And so leaning into that change and being able to be very adaptive while still achieving your day-to-day responsibilities, yeah, it absolutely is something that does take time. And you may not realize it at the moment, but all of that is practice that you are perfecting. Mm. So I have a couple final time for coffee questions, one of which involves flashing back very quickly to when you were in school, Adam. You alluded to the fact that you went to New York School of Visual Arts, which was established in 1947 as the Cartoonist and Illustrator School, which I think is really cool. And you majored in film, video, and animation. Is that right? That's correct. All right. You got your BFA. Did you know what you were going to do with that degree when you graduated? So when I was in school, starting in my junior year, I started interning for an animation studio called Four Kids Entertainment in New York. And at that particular time, I had thought, this is the path. I'm supposed to work here. Hopefully, I will get a job at this studio. I'll work my way up. And maybe this is the path for me. And whether that was the artistic side at that studio or on the business side, I really didn't know what that future held. But it made sense that like this was the industry that I should be in. One of those other aha moments was there was a big snowstorm one winter when I was interning there. And this was well before the days of cell phone technology. So nobody was texting or emailing 24-7 like in the, the world we may live in today. So there was a huge snowstorm. I mean, half of New York was shut down. I think it was 2003. And I remember I got dressed. I waited on the subway a little bit longer because they weren't running as efficiently. And I got to the office and it was a skeleton crew. And one of the executive producers was there and he was like, what are you doing here? I was like, I I don't know. It was was my day for work at the internship. And he was saying, you know, it's funny, like people just wouldn't show up on a day like this. And to me, that, that just didn't occur to me. I thought, you know, I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to this office. So why wouldn't I show up? When I think back to how my career took a left turn, I worked on an animated series that eventually got canceled. And I had a friend at MTV who was in their advertising organization and said, we need a trafficker at the time of a digital organization. That was the entry level role. I didn't understand what an ad trafficker was. I didn't understand any of the technology that went into putting up a display ad. So this is well before video was online. But what I quickly found was there were production elements as I learned the skills of that that were very relatable to the production elements that I learned when I was interning at the animation studio. And so it's an example of sort of where my career zigged and zagged in a way that I never could have predicted. And going back to about seeking out opportunities. Yeah, I was devastated when that show got canceled because again, how many animated series were being produced in New York at the time? Nobody knew what the future had held. And so for an opportunity to open, to go for it, and then find that actually I had skills and it matched with things that I had done previously was a really, really beneficial experience. And I have no doubt, Adam, that the fact that you trudged through the snow during that snowstorm and showed up as an intern so ingratiated you to the management there that they would give you a glowing review no matter what job you wanted to do after that. And I wouldn't have been surprised if they had offered you an advanced position earlier than they might have otherwise. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, in my senior year, while many of the people I went to school with were talking about the jobs they were hoping to land once they graduated, I had actually secured a position at that animation studio about four or five months before the end of the term. And part of it was because of just my time at the internship and they knew the type of work ethic that I had brought. I would just take whatever was kind of thrown at me. It goes back to before I even had that advice from Amy said to me, it was just do your job well, good things will happen. Oh my gosh, what a great example. So Adam, I try to ask 
all of my guests to share a time in their professional lives when they struggled. You may have even failed. I know I certainly did. But most importantly, how did you get through that difficult time? How did you get to the other side? And was there a lesson that you may have learned in the process? Yeah, (laughs) there's one mistake I made earlier in my career that probably still haunts me from day to day, from time to time. So I was at CBS. I worked with CBS Sports and one of the products that I worked on was the NFL. Every Sunday, there's only 17 of them in a given season. You had an advertiser that paid a lot of money to sponsor CBS's webpage. They had a number of elements, number of production elements. And again, there was only 17 of them every year. So there was a lot of planning and pre-production that went into launching that experience. And I remember, you know, this is one of the first big ones that was given to me. So I wanted to make sure that I crushed it, set everything up, triple checked it, was confident. Everything was perfect. Walked out of the door on the Friday. I would come in on Monday to see how everything performed. Again, going back to the era where there were no Blackberries or cell phones. So you really didn't know necessarily until that Monday. I came in on Monday and found out, well, the performance was zero because as much as I had set everything up and got everything right in the right position, forgot to turn it on. Oh, (laughs) my God. (laughs) <laughs> and so you can imagine that that didn't land well. <laughs> but I had uh, one, I had a very empathetic and reassuring management team. So they understood at the end of the day, everybody's human. And we were able to find and make some optimizations with that particular advertising client down the line and give them some other opportunities to advertise to make up for that missed opportunity. But yeah, that was one that I certainly lost a lot of sleep over back in the day. And even now I probably get chills as I describe it. So what was the lesson that you learned through that experience? Well, I think I was pretty hard on myself coming out of that. There were a few days and certainly some follow-up calls with the advertiser where you certainly hear how disappointed and frustrated they were. But what I learned was that you can talk through a situation as long as I go back to we were talking on the espresso shots, how empathy is the most important soft skill that I think an individual needs. And after you heard through the frustration, and I was empathetic certainly to the account executive, you know, it was dollars out of their pocket for the missed opportunity. I'm pathetic to the advertising client themselves. They had a lot of important needs that focused in on this particular Sunday. But we were able to work together to find a solution that, well, it wasn't exactly that particular sponsorship for that Sunday, something that still met the KPIs that they had set up. And in fact, for that particular advertiser, we worked with them so that they could have some increased exposure during the NFL playoffs. So it ended up working out for them where they were able to continue their advertising message throughout the season. But the lesson takeaway for me was to be able to work with your partners and really have patience and also can't be so hard on yourself because everybody is human and mistakes are going to happen and they will. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And It only takes having had one really big fuck up in your life to give you much more empathy for other people who screw up and you will cut them much more slack as a result. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could also see the people that were working with me like they (laughs) nobody thought the moment that I walked into the office and saw what had happened that I was walking around proud. So you can also pick up on their empathy to me realizing what a mistake I had made. So yeah, it really is, especially in this day and age, it's a really critical skill for all levels of an employee because at the end of the day, we work with people. It doesn't matter how digital or how remote your job may be. We work We work with people. Yeah. You got to press the on button. <laughs> right. That's right. All right. Final question. If you could go back to college, back to New York School of Visual Arts, And do it all over again, Adam. But based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? I don't think I realized at the time how important aspects of business were. And what I mean by that is when I was going through school, we were making an animated short. And the focus of many was I just got to crush myself for the next 18 months and finish this video. But there was so much more that happens after that. It's not like you're really done once you finish the final drawing or export that video and could have it to showcase around. You then have to market yourself, you as an individual or a business. And going back to my point of everybody's always selling. I didn't realize that earlier in my career, certainly when I was in college, that you're your biggest advocate. And it's really important to understand how you can market yourself and create almost like a personal brand as a business for yourself as you enter the workforce. Absolutely. Because you can make the best films, videos, ads in the world, but if you don't have people watching them, that kind of defeats the purpose. That's right. That's 100% (laughs) right. 
Adam, I want to thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. You have such a fascinating field. And I have to confess, there's quite a bit of it that went over my head, but I'm sure that wasn't the case with our listeners because they are much more digitally savvy than I am. And I I just really appreciate you making the time to share your experience and your expertise with me and the T4C community. Absolutely. I appreciate the time to talk to you and your listeners and, uh, and, and thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.